on the surface, if you just take snapshots of Western culture right now, um, the prognosis is not good. I think it's the most universal wound on this earth. It is universal on this planet. I lost everything at an early age. Tell me about your father. Was he around? No, never. He left without saying goodbye. He left a note. He left a note, and it wasn't even to me. My father didn't ever accept me, ever, for anything I did. He, he just left. He didn't even say why. The absence of a father is, it's just a hole you can't fill. And I wasn't the man. I wasn't taught to step up. Life is always a battle. It's who comes up standing. I would tell her, not to search for her daddy's love everywhere. If we want our kids to have a future with hope, and dignity to it, we have got to get fatherhood back. I'd had conversations with, um, with friends about it before and, and men that were kind of mentors in my life. Um, and then, you know, reading books and going through some curriculum, faith-based stuff. Um, Wild at Heart is one of the books that uh, I read that really put this on my heart and mind. And it's written by a guy named John Eldridge, who I was lucky enough to get into the film. Um, and uh, I think the, the pinnacle moment, though, was I was fishing with a friend of mine. And uh, we were driving back, talking about it, and, and it just uh, it hit me that this is what we've got to do next. Because I felt like American Myth, I mean, that was going to be a really tough act to follow because it had done really well. But uh, this is just such a huge issue and such an a important role to play. At that, at that moment, it was, it was pretty clear that that's what needed to be done. Just knowing you personally, it's interesting to me, though, because uh, you yourself, I wouldn't think this issue would be very relatable. You have a very close relationship with your dad. I do. And, and so you don't come from that background yourself. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I have a great relationship with my dad. And, and you know, I think the thing about that is that it can play both ways. Um, you know, there are people who don't have a relationship with their father, and it's, it's, it's uh, relevant to them. But, like, for me, I mean, I had a great relationship with my father, and it makes me have a little more compassion for the people that didn't. And I can see how important that is. And, you know, I, I see how important the role for me being a father to my kids is. And so it wasn't, you know, I'm sure I'll get asked that a lot over the next couple of years. And, you know, I might have given my dad a complex. <laughs> but, I mean, that's not really where it came from. It came from, hey, this is, you know, this is the skill set I've been given is telling stories and trying to make some change with those stories. And this is something that needs to be addressed. So it didn't come from a personal experience. I think it just came from a need. And, and, you know, my skill set kind of fits into part of the solution. And you, of course, two kids of your own. Yeah. How are you a different father now than when you started this project? Um, you know, I think, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, being a father, I mean, one of the best ways to learn something is to teach it. And going through this film and the research and stuff like that, you and, you know, I kind of knew it before, going, reading The Wild at Heart and going through that curriculum and stuff, but um, I was doing a, a magazine interview yesterday. And I was asked the same question. And, you know, part of the, part of the film, I talked to prostitutes in, in absent because I, with no disrespect, you're, you're not going to find a woman on the street that's a prostitute who had a good father figure. You're just not. And so, you know, when you're out, you're out on the street and you're, and you're talking to a prostitute in this, you know, dingy little valley or, or alley in town, I mean, their pimp is sitting behind you in a car, you know, counting the time. And you're sitting there and you're, you ask them, well, how do you think your life would be different if you had a father? And you see how that impacts them and you see it in their face. 
and then you know you go home to uh, tell your little girl good night you see how important your role is and so how did how did it affect me is just I see how important it is and and more so the damage that can be done if I don't do the right job so and I love how you describe it about how the father's the first person for all of us when we come into the world that gets to say thumbs up thumbs down yeah. I embrace or I reject this individual how is that different than moms well I mind? think you know it, most people would understand that we have this inherent connection to our mother I mean we're literally con connected to our mother I mean um, you know you got the whole nursing thing and then there's an emotional bond between a mother that is typically stronger and the father is the first other and it's you know as, as he's the first outside voice I mean it's the first everything and, and he's the one that you go, hey, you know, what do you think, man? And, and, you know, for boys, boys have a different set of questions than girls. You know, boys want to know, am I, am I strong? Am I good enough? Do I have what it takes? Am I heroic? And, and, and girls are, you know, am I beautiful? Do you value me? Would you fight for me? And when they ask their dad that question in one way or another, and the answer is no, the effects are just, you know, innumerable because they take that out for the rest of their life and try to get that question answered. In so many different ways, you know, whether it's promiscuity or materialism or being hyper driven or, you know, having to be good at sports, whatever. A lot of that comes from not getting that question answered by their dad. I mean, talk about hyper driven. A couple other people in the movie that I think you could qualify for that, that people are going to be interested to know are in this, uh, especially here in New Mexico. Johnny Tapia. Yeah. Also James Hetfield from Metallica. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about how those folks came into this project. Well, you know, it's, it's really interesting because the day that I decided to do this in that conversation with my friend, we were driving and we were talking about it. And the very first edit that came into my mind, I thought how poignant that would be to have Johnny talking about, you know, the loss of his father and his loss of his mother and just, you know, being emotional about that. And then you cut to him just knocking the crud out of somebody in a boxing match. And, and you know, that comes from the wound. Um, and so just got in touch with him and, and um, Teresa, his wife, who, both of them are the most fantastic people and, and really got into this, into this subject. But, um, you know, that's how Johnny came into it. And then Hetfield, you know, um, we've known each other. You and I have known each other for a long time. And, uh, you know, I've been a Metallica fan since 1985. Mm -hmm. And so, I, of course, I know his story and his, his father left. He just took off. Um, and he lost his mother, and, and I thought, well, how interesting it would be to, I mean, not only how that wound affected him as a person, but also how it affected the music, which has affected so many people. I mean, it, it's so interesting to see how those effects take place down the line, right. whether it's Hetfield or whether it's, you know, part of the film, I, I look into the, the discovery of the mass grave on the west side. If, if you unpack that and you think of that backwards, those girls were primarily prostitutes and probably wouldn't have been on the street if they had a good father. And so, I mean, it's just, it, it's interesting how it, it, you know, it just expands, but it all kind of boils back to the same thing. Talk about your approach as a director, as a filmmaker. I, I know between America and Math, between this one, uh, you very much want to get in to this as much as possible, yeah. into the moment. Mm -hmm. So much so that when it comes to Tapia, you almost had your... Life in your own hands for a minute at one <laughs> yeah. point, I understand, right? Yeah, well, we had that with American meth, you know, because I, I, I lived with the meth addicts, and, and there were some pretty interesting moments there. And then, yeah, the fight with Tapia, I mean, he, uh, he had his fight, and as we were leaving the ring, I mean, the, the crowd caved in because there were no guardrails, and so we were literally running for our lives. But, you know, I just think that's the only way you can tell the story. Um, and... I mean, you know this as well as anyone else. If you're, if you're going to do a good job interviewing someone, it's not, okay, here's question one, here's question two, here's question three. It's, you know, you invest yourself and you have a conversation with that person and you catch it on, you catch it on film. And, and that's really all I'm trying to do is, I mean, I'm not going to show up and ask James ten questions. I'm going to show up and talk to him man to man about, you know, how did this affect your life? Or Johnny, how did this affect your life? And, and I think that's the only way you can really tell the story the right way is to, you know, not be intrusive and not make yourself a part of it, but to get in there with them. It's not easy, though, when you're lugging equipment, cameras. Yeah. How do you sort of keep that real when you've got sort of contrived situations and things? You know, Kev, I think that's probably the thing that surprises people the most. Um, 
when you look at the success of the films, you know, I do, I'm the only person that works on these things. And I don't have a big film crew. I, here's a secret that'll blow your mind. I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years now. I don't even own a light. You know, it's just me and a camera and a tripod and that's it. And I think that by not having all that stuff, you know, it, you're not so intrusive. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that helps people open up a little bit more. Um, you know, it's been tough at times when it's just me, but uh, for the most part, you know, you set it up, you sit down, you start talking, you forget about that. And by the time you're done, you've got a, you've got a great conversation on tape. What is, what is your goal when this thing comes out? Is it just awareness? I know on the website you got a place where people can write letters to their fathers. Yeah. You're talking about working with churches. What's the end game here? What are you hoping happens? You know, um, honestly, I think at the end of the day, when all is said and done, what I really want to happen is for people to realize that it, it's time for us to start fighting for the hearts of our children. Um, that's what the most important thing is, is we've got to realize that this is not a joke, and if we don't, if we don't do the job, then we're going to just kind of leave them high and dry for the rest of the world to do it for them. And, I mean, I don't want to get myself in trouble, but if, if Paris Hilton is going to be the role model for my daughter, that's my fault. And, you know, you know exactly what I'm saying. It's, it's our job to do that, and I think we've just got to realize... There's a, there's a history of how we got to this point in the film, but really we just lost the understanding of how to do that. And I think that's what I want with the film is just to create that understanding of, oh, this is what it's supposed to look like and this is kind of how it started to go away and, and this is the damage that it causes. And if we, can, if we can start the understanding, then we can start the change. So I think the most important thing is, is to just get people to realize we got to start fighting for our kids and you know, obviously we want it to be commercially successful and we want to get it out you know as many places as possible but at at the end of the day that's what i'd really like to see happen